thank you so much for tuning in over uh, over what is for many of you your your lunch hour. So we appreciate that. So this is a, a preview uh, for our latest University of Washington uh, tri-campus greenhouse gas emissions inventory uh, that uses 2022 uh, data primarily. We also looked at 2019. And we are going to um, publish that report in early January. So keep your eyes peeled. But again, this is a preview and a sneak peek at a lot of the key findings from that report. So before we, we launch into uh, the, the findings from the report, I wanted to do a quick introduction of uh, UW Sustainability and myself and Marilyn, who will be your main presenters today. So for those of you that aren't familiar with the UW Sustainability Office, um, this is a Seattle campus office, both Tacoma and Bothell have um, some smaller teams working on sustainability issues and, and we all work together, of course. But I'm the UW Sustainability Director, Lisa DeLude. We have Marilyn Ostergren here, who's our energy and sustainability specialist in our office, and she's gonna be doing the bulk of the reporting. She's been the project manager for this important work. And then in the background is our uh, Damon Eklund, our communications manager. So thank you, Damon, for helping us make this happen. Um, we also have two new positions in our office that we're currently hiring for, uh, and one open, another open position, the CSF program manager. So just putting that on everyone's radar helps spread the word if you're interested. And lastly, I wanted to just um, speak to our, our great group of student interns that you can see there at the bottom. They do important work uh, to help help our office and, and help advance some of these goals across UW. Next slide, please. So I wanna set a little bit of context for why we have conducted uh, this 2022 greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So to start off, we really have not done as a university a public facing emissions inventory since 2005. So we're long overdue for something that's um, really robust and comprehensive and that is published on our website. <clears throat> that's not to say that UW does not or has not uh, tracked our greenhouse gas emissions. We do and we're required to track and report a good portion of those different emissions to the state and the federal government. Our office also has a, a dashboard, slightly out of date at this point. It will be updated very soon, thanks to this inventory, um, so that we're keeping tabs and tracking our emissions inventories and progress over our baseline in terms of emissions reductions. <clears throat> but we, we really felt that this, this report was timely and needed. Uh, this is also a unique inventory in that the university has never before looked at emissions associated with goods and services purchased. So there's some interesting findings around that that Marilyn's going to go over today, go over with you all today. Uh, this report also includes all three campuses, as well as uh, some of UW's major medical facilities, which is uh, slightly different than some of our previous inventories or reports. The other key piece that you'll notice uh, with Marilyn's presentation and with the report when it's published is that we've really tried to dissect that information in a in a new way. So we really wanna look at not only emissions for the university as a whole, but also for individual units like medicine, like athletics, like housing and food services. And we also wanna look at it by campus. Uh, and to some extent, the more that we dissect some of this data into smaller components, we're able to see some of the differences and some of the opportunities for UW to really make uh, impactful decisions uh, and move the needle in terms of reducing our, our own greenhouse gas emissions. This inventory is all, was also done purposefully um, looking ahead to our update to the, to the UW Sustainability Action Plan. So we have an action plan in place. If you haven't seen it, it's on our website, but we update that, sort of do a major update to that document every five years. So we felt we really needed to get current data, uh, both pre and post pandemic data, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, get that current data and make sure that we have a good grasp of it so that it can be in integrated into that next iteration of the sustainability action plan, as well as some of our other key strategic planning documents, such as the zero carbon roadmap. So we'll be kicking off that uh, SAP update in the fall of 2024. And lastly, I think everybody's familiar with the phrase that you can't manage what you don't measure. 
Um, and we felt like that sort of sums it all up. If we really want to address this, this issue uh, across our university, um, and this is a, obviously a very critical global issue, we really need to have a good grasp of the current data and where the opportunities are. So um, I'm going to pass it over to Marilyn. Please, as we go, put your questions in the chat. We are aiming to, to present for about 30 minutes uh, or so, and then we'll have plenty of time to take questions um, <clears throat> once Marilyn's completed her, her presentation. All right, Marilyn, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Okay, the first few slides, I'm gonna give you a, a sort of preview of the results of the inventory, plus a little bit of education about greenhouse gases in case some people in the audience are unfamiliar with the concepts. So what you're looking at right now is a breakdown of our emissions for 2022. We also uh, looked at 2019 and then compared to our 2005 inventory. You might immediately notice the largest percentage is from goods and services purchased. As Lisa mentioned, this is the first year we've we've done that. And I'll talk a little more about what that means and how we did it. Um, more traditionally, we're used to looking at fossil fuel consumption in buildings. That's mostly about burning fossil fuels to heat space and to heat water for tap water and showers and such. Um, air travel you know, profession, or tra travel in the service of, of uh, the work of the university, commuting to and from campus. And then that 5% other includes uh, what's called fugitive emissions. I'll explain that a little bit. Electricity. I'll talk about why our electricity emissions are very low. And then our fleet, which is a small uh, percentage of our emissions. Okay, I want to explain that little E. So the, the total number is about 524,500 metric tons CO2E, which stands for equivalent. And that is referencing the fact that not all greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide. So this little bubble display here shows the proportion of the other greenhouse gases um, emitted in the, US, in the US. So the vast majority is carbon dioxide but we also have methane. You may be aware that methane is the, the major component in natural gas. It's also a result of decomposition, um, cows burping. Um, and then um, nitrous oxide, which is major source is actually decomposition from fertilizers. It also happens to be an anesthetic gas, laughing gas, and we still use some of that in the medical centers. That, so that's a powerful greenhouse gas. And then the tiny bubble, it actually says HFCs and others. Uh, that's primarily uh, chemicals, uh, are, um, chemicals that have high uh, global warming potential, and that includes refrigerants. So the chemicals used in um, chillers for air conditioning and refrigerators. And those are actually um, the things we call fugitive emissions. Those are emissions that are sort of incidentally lost, but that have greenhouse gas impacts. And then a reminder that the reason they're called greenhouse gas emissions is because they act somewhat like a greenhouse in terms of trapping heat so it can't escape uh, the atmosphere, which is why it causes warming. You also may be familiar with this way of, of uh, dividing up or categorizing emissions. We don't really emphasize this in the report, but some of you are familiar with it and it's useful to understand. Scope one refers to emissions that are literally emitted from campus or by our actions. So that from burning natural gas, from burning fuel in, in UW's own vehicles, from fugitive emissions, um, which include the anesthetic gases, the refrigerants. Um, we also have a little bit of methane that escapes from the historic landfill that used to be a open pit landfill um, down near the stadium, now covered with parking lots, but unfortunately the material in there is continuing to degrade, so it emits some, some methane. And then over on the left, scope two refers to emissions that happen when energy is generated with, with fossil fuels, so coal or natural gas. Um, and the reason we have very little emissions in that category is the three campuses get their, get their electricity from low or no emission sources. Seattle campus gets our electricity from Seattle City Light, mostly hydropower, some solar, some wind, some nuclear. Um, 
Tacoma similarly get their, their power, their electricity from Tacoma Power, which is also mostly hydro. Bothell gets their electricity from Puget Sound Energy, and Puget Sound Energy does have a fair amount of, of um, coal and gas in their mix, but they also have a product called Green Direct, where they have developed wind and solar farms explicitly so that they can offer the electricity from those to their customers, their uh, large customers, and Bothell has made that choice to pay a little more. So they have they have uh, zero carbon electricity as well. And then on the right, scope three emissions referred to as indirect emissions. Those are all the things we do where other people are burning the fossil fuels, but are using those services means that we're indirectly responsible for them. So that includes air travel, it includes commuting, it includes purchased goods and services. So the bubble or the uh, donut on the left is the one you already saw. The donut on the right just shows what our emissions look like broken down into those three scopes. So for example, um, scope three includes goods and service plus commuting and air travel. So that's why it's 80% bigger on the right than on the left. And, the, and you can see that that very, very small amount of emissions from electricity. And that's actually mostly from outlying very small units like the Friday Harbor Labs. Okay, so this is what it looks like over time. Over there to the right, you see the 2019 and 2022, the measurements we did for this effort. And then 2005 is the baseline year. And you may immediately say, wait a minute, I thought we didn't inventory goods and services in 2005. And in, in, in fact, we did not. This is just an estimate based on, on population growth. We needed a placeholder there to um, see the impact over time. But as you can see, um, while there are some reductions, for example, in air travel and commuting, overall, our emissions are larger than in 2005. There was some uh, reduction since since 20, uh, between 2019 and 2022. And then as Lisa mentioned, we, we broke up the emissions by unit. So there on the left, we have UW, Bothell, and Tacoma, which have similar profiles. And you can see that that where their where emissions are varies from unit to unit. So, for example, Bothell and Tacoma have high commuting emissions because they're relatively low in, in other sources. They don't have a lot of intensive um, um, energy intensive research, for example. Uh, intercollegiate athletics, they have over half of their emissions are from air travel because they need to travel to um, you know, locations for, for athletic competitions. Housing and food service and UW Medicine, you know, service providers. So a lot of their emissions are associated with the goods and services they produce, they purchase in order to provide those services. And then um, one of the unique things about UW Seattle is a lot of their substantial amount of emissions associated with construction, which, which comes under goods and services. And then, of course, the um, substantial fossil fuel combustion for heating and cooling. Okay, so now we'll look at some of the key findings. Um, this first one won't come as a huge surprise that Seattle rather dwarfs Bothell and Tacoma in its fossil fuel combustion. Um, and that's um, in large part because Seattle mostly heats with natural gas. Of course, it's mostly because Seattle, the Seattle campus is just simply that much larger. Um, but that just focuses on you know where where our main uh, source of emissions come from, and this amount does include the fleet as well as uh, natural gas burnt for for heating. But the fleet's really fa fairly uh, minimal co contributor. Okay, next air travel. So this chart is is showing numbers of flights rather than uh, emissions, though emissions will look very similar. But I'm showing clearly more than just 2019 and 2022 just makes it very clear that the dramatic impact of COVID and it's um, it looks like our air travel, unfortunately, is popping back up. So 2022 still seem to be under the influence of COVID, but um, our initial data gathering since then looks like we're popping back up. So we have work to do there. Commuting, we've, we've made strides in commuting over the years, so lower even than 2005, despite a substantial increase in the population, 
and uh, this chart helps us see what's going on. Um, we've had significant increase in transit ridership, thanks in large part to the to the U Pass. It it dropped considerably during COVID, um, but a big increase in telecommuting, and of course that's great for our uh, emissions since telecommuting is emission free. Um, also, you see a, a significant reduction in driving alone, which is which is what um, our efforts have really focused on, making it easier to walk, bike, and take transit, and and to ride share. Okay, now I'm going to talk about goods and services, and this donut chart is ju just showing you that the split between about 51% of the emissions are associated with purchased goods. 38% with services and another 11% with construction. And then a little bit of an explanation of what it means to have emissions associated with purchased goods and services. It's a little more easy to understand, I think, with goods. You know, you have emissions associated with extraction, whether that's logging or mining or agriculture, emissions associated with production in a factory, for example, and then transportation. So those are sort of, you can think of them as the embodied emissions. So you purchase a um, product and in some ways are responsible for all those emissions throughout the supply chain. Oops, misspelled supply. And then um, services is a little less intuitive, but basically emissions associated with, for example, maintaining the office buildings where the service providers um, do their work or air travel for, for providing their services or fleet. So there are there are emissions associated with, with services as well. Okay, here's an initial view of our data for the campus as a whole. These are the top categories. These categories are categories um, identified actually by the US Census Bureau to categorize commerce. But these have been used to um, do extensive research on emissions associated with each of these categories. And um, so obviously these are these are average numbers because there are a huge variety of things that fall within those categories. So this is, a, is at this stage in the development of, of figuring out how to inventory these emissions. It's somewhat rough, but it still gives us a, a pointer to to what we're doing, what we're purchasing that that has um, high impact. We also split uh, split this data up by unit. I'm just going to show you a few to show you how wildly it differs between units. So I'm going to show you the same categories for UW Seattle. You can see it looks very different. Um, huge uh, percentage from professional services, um, large percentage from construction, and a fair amount of, or yeah, uh, not all, but a fair amount of uh, professional services is, uh, associated with construction as well, because it includes you know, the engineering and the design and architectural work, um, plus many other things. Uh, another dramatic example, or the most dramatic example is housing and food services, where Virtually all of the their emissions are associated with food um, food purchases. Uh, and and speaking of food, we also dive deeper into food uh, for that um, food that housing and food services purchases. And I'll explain how to read this chart on the left is the cost of those foods. So the percentage of the budget spent on those various food categories on the right is the percentage of the emissions. That are resulting or that are associated with those the food purchases, and what becomes apparent and perhaps not terribly surprising is that protein and dairy and specifically animal products are the ones that are very high, very emission intensive, and the others are um, relatively much lower emission intensive. You can also um, this is this is both a view of our food purchases, but also a glimpse of where we're heading with all of our purchases. Ultimately, we should be able to have this sort of more granular data so we can better understand where to focus our efforts for emission reduction. Okay, so this is back to the initial donut chart I showed you, hopefully with some more insight into what all these categories mean. And next we'll look at 
anticipated pathways in the future. So our consultants produce this, what's called a wedge diagram, and I'll walk through how to, how to read it. Um, on the left is where we are now, or it's actually 2022, where we were when the inventory was completed. The very top dotted line refers to anticipated emissions if we did nothing. The gray wedge refers to the expected impact of state legislation. So even if the UW didn't take action because we're in this environment where reductions are happening externally, it would ultimately reduce our inventory. But then the big part of the, you know, the big wedges are, of course, actions that the UW will take or is taking. So um, at the top, we have commuting. We're anticipating, hoping for at least 9% reduction by 2050. And that will be you know, continuing those efforts um, that, that transportation services has long um, been taking to make it easier to use lower impact forms of, of transportation to get to and from campus. The next very narrow bit um, is fleet electrification. It's a small amount, but it's a real success story. The fleet is well on its way and has a clear pathway toward replacing all of the uh, internal combustion engine vehicles with electrical vehicles. And next, air travel. So this is a challenging one, and uh, we've been working for a few years now, and we'll continue to work to, to find ways to reduce our our emissions from air travel, and we're hoping for at least 25% reduction by 2050. And then the really big wedges with the 76% reduction is what we're anticipating from our energy renewal efforts that, that is um, that is begun. And that includes electrification, so moving from burning natural gas to using electricity for, for heat pumps, et cetera, and then also efficiency. Uh, and then finally, refrigerants, it's not even hardly visible here, but a small amount of reduction um, from refrigerants based on improved refrigerant management, and then also the, the refrigerants with the most global warming potential are, are being phased out. Uh, now, we, we haven't included goods and services purchased in this, in this wedge diagram. We do have a version of the diagram in the report with goods and services, but um, little, little that that's you know kind of new territory for us, so we're a little less sure how that will look. But we are we are already undertaking some efforts to reduce emissions in that area. Uh, in particular, we are revising the green building standard that's um, due to come out soon. It's uh, a much expanded and and more detailed. Uh, building standard to help us em uh, reduce emissions associated with construction. Uh, and then also, um, oops, housing and food services for years has, has been on a pathway to being more and more sustainable. And that includes efforts to provide better, cheaper, more enticing plant-based options that would help us reduce purchases um, of animal products with high emission. Uh, and then also our UW purchasing, this is a screenshot from their website, has been working for years to encourage more, more sustainable purchasing options. Okay, that's the end of, of the presentation. I'll pass it back to Lisa. Okay, thanks, Marilyn. Um, so uh, I want to reiterate um, our final report is is coming. Um, we're we're making the finishing touches on it. And I neglected to say at the beginning that this is a, a was a consultant um, partnership project with our office. So Cascadia Consulting, Eco Data Lab, and uh, Hammerschlag LLC were part of the consultant team that um, helped us with this inventory. So apologies if any of any of our fantastic consultants are listening uh, that helped us um, helped us with this work. Um, we will be make sure that you um, stay in touch with our office. Uh, we have if you visit our page, we have a variety of ways that you can ensure that you're getting our newsletter that you're getting blog posts and that you're seeing some events like these um, to stay engaged. Uh, and with that, I think I hit on some of the summary stuff, but we'll we'll take questions um, that folks put into the chat and the Q&A. So why don't I yeah. read them? Okay. 
Um, and then Marilyn, uh, we can, whatever, we can figure out what's most appropriate for whom to answer. Okay. So Brian, <clears throat> I'm seeing Brian McCartan said the goods and services was rising between 20, 2019 and 2022. And that seems counterintuitive uh, compared to UW spending, which dropped yeah. dramatically in those years. Marilyn, do you have any thoughts on that? Or Well, the, the main thing I'm aware of um, is that UW medicine um, spending increased quite a bit. And, and that, that um, probably was due to the fact, you know, there was a lot of demand for medical services that was unmet during COVID. And so then there was a increase in, in um, procedures and such. So that's, that's, um, that, that's, you know, what we, what we theorize is contributing to it. And there, there is, um, Brian, you're more aware of our spending. Um, we've had some concern. This is the first time we've inventoried goods and services, and we worked hard to be sure we were capturing all of our purchasing data. Um, but there's a, there's a possibility that we missed some of it. So that could okay. that could be playing a role there. Good one to maybe for us to look into uh, after the report's published. Okay, uh, Marilyn, we've got a question from Liz on does goods include the materials purchased for construction, such as lumber, concrete, or is that included in construction? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, the fact that construction is pulled out, uh, my understanding is that that the materials must be included there. Yeah, that that's my understanding as well. Yeah. And the uh, you know, Marilyn referenced the green building standard, the new green building standard that's coming for the university in the next few months, and and it addresses the embodied carbon from materials such as lumber and concrete, et cetera. Okay, uh, a question from Will. Does not using one day shipping for goods purchased have a major impact? So I'm not an expert in that. I, I think it does. And that that's the kind of thing um, that this inventory, unfortunately, doesn't give us uh, precise insight into. In the future, we hope we will have that level of granularity, but right now, it doesn't, you know, it just has a generic um, average emission impact, impact per category and doesn't reflect the fact that we may have um, made a, a great effort to, you know, buy a more sustainable version of a product. So, uh, yeah, great question, but not one that this inventory delved into. Okay, the next question is from Kristoff. <laughs> Were there any interesting revelations regarding the unit breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions across industry categories? And I'm not sure if Christoph meant the industry categories and goods and services purchased. For, yeah, well, yeah, I think he's meaning that. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I pointed to a few, um, it's, the data is not entirely satisfying to look at because it's it's digging through a lot of um, lists of categories that are generic or have have obscure names to them. Um, you know, housing and food services was the one that was most clear. Um, I learned maybe everybody else knows that athletics um, feeds their their students, so there were emissions associated with food for athletics as well as housing and food services. Um, the the fact that the construction um, had a significant impact on UW Seattle's emissions associated with goods and services. Um, there were also, when I tried to look deeper into the goods and services categories, um, software was a big one. Actually, Bothell and Tacoma um, purchasing or paying for services for um, repairs and maintenance was relatively high. Those are the highlights I could find. Okay, next question from Marcy is how are we, how did we track air travel? Yeah, okay, I know a lot about that. I'll try not to go into too much detail, but basically there's two sources of data. There are people who fly and get reimbursed through what's referred to as e-travel. And then there are people who fly through a central travel account. 
and we have data from both of those. There's, there's, you know, each flight has information about the date and the origin and destination. So we took that information, calculated the distance. Of course, that's going to be a little imprecise. We couldn't tell if it was a two-leg trip, for example. We just assumed flying as the crow flies. Um, and then and then we did um we used we we leaned on uh Stanford's um strategy for for calculating emissions, which was um based on whether the based on the distance of flight. So shorter flights have slightly higher emissions because takeoff and landing are such a high percentage. Um long haul flights um have higher emissions because the few the plane has to carry so much fuel. So a little bit of difference based on um, difference in emissions based on distance of flight. And then with a, um, a factor, a, um, a factor um, accounting for the, the fact that plane contrails actually have a measurable impact on, on global warming, water in the upper atmosphere traps heat. Hope I answered that one. All right, Marilyn, the next question is from Lyle. Which emissions were oh. estimated based on a, a spend-based model? Well, I think you're referring to all of uh, all of the emissions for goods and services were based on spend. So we, the data we had was how much money we spent in the different categories. Everything else, I don't think there's an exception to that, other than you know how I described air travel was based on you know, how much fuel we purchased. So amounts um, of yeah, fuel or, for example, amounts of refrigerants that we, we purchased. Great. Um, and then uh, the next question from Sharzad is, following Will's question, have you developed or are you considering some kind of guide or campaign to promote actions, behavior change for folks that they can adopt to contribute to our mission reduction goals. Do you want to take that one, Lisa? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. So we do have a lot of um, resources already on our, our website for um, anyone uh, across the university to take individual action and, and uh, particularly for students, different student groups that you can get involved with. Um, but we also, you know, see our uh, sustainability action plan and then the, the update that we're preparing for, that, that will be really our, our guide um, as to where as a university we need to focus our time and our energy and our, our funding so that we can really move the needle on um, some of these bigger, hairier challenges, um, such, such as the ones Marilyn mentioned, goods and services, air travel, fossil fuel combustion, particularly the steam plant at the central campus. Um, but to that that said, I think uh, there's always uh, lots of improvement for, for all of us in terms of our individual actions and, and maybe something that, that we can work on uh, expanding and improving in terms of resources for our community on our various websites. Uh, Lisa and Marilyn, I wanna make sure to follow up on that, there's also um, a something that got submitted through the Q&A option um, that kind of follows up on that, which is, do you anticipate these findings will enable you to unlock more motivation from partner UW departments to reduce emissions? And how do you envision other departments to engage with these findings? And there was also a question later in the chat on, are there any departments that are um, successfully um, tackling some of the, the, the trickier aspects around this? Great yeah, all, all great questions. Uh, I'll take I'll take a stab at it, and Marilyn, you add, and Damon add anything that I've forgotten. Um, that that's precisely what we're hoping. So we're we are uh, hoping that through this webinar and through subsequent webinars to make sure that our community is more informed of where our missions come from, that we will be able to um, <clears throat> have more of a shared understanding of not only where where our missions come from, but then how do we move forward with implementing the strategies and actions in our sustainability action plan, which covers not only actions we can take in our operations, but also in research, academics, and learning, and community partnerships. So um, engagement and staying informed, um, 
not only through through events like these, but also when we we're going to have a robust engagement process with the development of the sustainability action plan that we want you all and partners to be involved in. And then perhaps even more importantly, uh, or equally important is, is continuing those partnerships um, and, and leaning on each other and working together to implement the plan. Um, so I think those are some, definitely some key areas that we're hoping to sort of expand and build more momentum and partnership. Uh, we're gonna need all the help we can get. Obviously we're not gonna get any of this done uh, alone. And then I, I will just highlight some of the uh, committees that that our office facilitates and their their university wide representation with these committees. So we have a quarterly environmental stewardship committee meeting that has committee members um, that help advise uh, and move some of these big strategic initiatives forward. Anyone is welcome to join those. They are posted on our website. Um, we also have uh, an executive committee for the sustainability action plan, um, and uh, we're we're looking always looking for more participation if folks are interested in getting involved that that get in more into the weeds of not only development of the action plan but uh, implementation. Um, so you're welcome to send us a note for more uh, if you're, you're curious about how to get involved in that. And then the fall of next year, we are <laughs> launching a new student sustainability advisory committee. We really feel like our office is sort of this, we look at ourselves as a hub, uh, connecting a lot of different spokes across this very, very large university. Um, and we wanna make sure that students in particular have a, a way to be more connected to and engaged with our sustainability action plan. Um, and we think that's also a way to to help um, increase participation and engagement back to the original question. So hopefully that wasn't too long-winded. Marilyn, any, uh, or Damon, anything I'm forgetting there? But the question about are there units uh, doing things to reduce their emissions? Um, so first of all, I bet there are a lot that we haven't heard about, So we, and we'd love to hear about them, but a few that I'm aware of. One, um, uh, the philosophy department has a statement about uh, their their views on air travel. So they've sort of committed to try to to minimize their air travel. Um, UW Medicine is is ramping up a substantial effort um, to to uh, look at their um, sustainability performance um, and have hired people and have have people focused on that. Um, so that just a couple of examples of, of people independently working on sustainability in their own units. Um, the Foster School, um, very interested in sustainability. They've been trying to get their, their own um, emission data for their buildings um, so they can track that and do something about it. So yes, there are departments who are actively working on this. Okay, great. Uh, next question is from, David, are you planning to use offsets to reach reduction goals? Um, generally speaking, we are not. We really want to work hard to um, reduce our emissions directly. Um, there's a lot of, um, I think a lot of issues with, as probably many of you know, with, with offsets, third-party offsets. So that's, that's not to say that it's totally out of the running, but our focus, um, with uh, with setting goals and reducing our emissions is really direct emission reduction. Okay, uh, the next question is from Brian. Have you started to consider impacts in the athletic program with the shift from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten and the assumption that there will be more frequent long distance travel for games and events? <clears throat> um, yes, uh, and I know, you know, uh, we have a, as Men Air Marilyn mentioned, we have a air travel working group and athletics is um, a participant in that and recognize that that move will result in more emissions from air travel. And so that will, that's a, a challenge and a consideration ahead of us um, as, as we work, on, work to address air travel. Okay, the next question is from Peter. There was a news broadcast that showed almost a 50% increase in athletics travel with Big Ten. Yeah, I, it's, it's like I said, gonna be a, quite a challenge. Uh, a question from Scott, what surprised you most about the results? What key areas would you want to analyze further if new and better data became available? You wanna take that one, Marilyn? 
Um, sure. Um, I'm so deep into it at this point that it's hard to remember where the surprises were, but certainly, well, we knew we knew goods and services purchase would be big. And of course it was. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I showed you the highlights, um, which was the most surprising, uh, not surprising, but to see how big the um, the contribution of the central power plant on the Seattle campus was, was, was telling. Do you have any other thoughts, Lisa? Yeah, I'll say one, the one thing that I think was probably um, what we anticipated to see was, was sort of confirmed, but that needs a lot more um, analysis and diving into is the, uh, for UW Medicine, the uh, percent of emissions from goods mm -hmm. and services purchased. And when you actually go into that spend data, it's very complex, very interesting. And so because that's such a big portion of the university's total spend, meaning UW Medicine, a unit that has a huge, huge amount of um, expenditures, as one might imagine, that's really uh, a big portion of the work ahead of us. And that we, I think we need to dive into to um, make sure we're addressing the opportunities that are presented there, so. Good question. <clears throat> okay, the next question is from Forrest. Are there departments or units successfully tackling some of the most more challenging aspects? Um, I, I guess I can say, I, you know, Forrest, I bet, I bet there are, and uh, it's such a big place that I think, um, well, I should say on the academic research learning section, absolutely. I think that's an area where UW is uh, definitely a leader, a, a climate leader, um, and a sustainability leader. Um, in terms of uh, how you know departments and units are working on this with our operations, I can say that you know our our office is is housed in facilities, and like I said, we're we're a hub trying to connect and and work across this large organization and every all the units that we work with. Um, and I'd say the university as a whole is very committed to this. I think um, with not only with this report, but also with our sustainability action plan, we're, we're starting to get more and more momentum, um, more and more interest from folks saying, how can we get involved? How can we help? Um, and where can we really, uh, again, put our time and energy, knowing that we all have limited time and resources to really move the needle on some of these issues. So. I'm not sure if that totally answers your question, but <clears throat> Marilyn, would you add add anything to that? No, I mean, I, I think of the one story I heard um, this one uh, department in um, that looks looks at infectious diseases in children. And I wouldn't, I, they, they talked about um, some amazing things they did pretty much because of COVID restrictions, but to reduce their air travel. And I just, I, I'm always wanting to know, I know there are more great stories out there like that, that we'd like to gather, but I, I, I don't know of any others that I can point at right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there's tons of examples out there and, and we just, we probably should find some way to collect some more of them. <laughs> Okay, uh, Marilyn, we had a question from both Peter and David that are sort of on the technical side. Uh, oh. What emissions factors did we use for um, air travel and for refrigerants? Yeah, well, it says airline adjustment factor, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that me if that's specific airlines. We didn't look. I know I know different airlines oh. have different performances. We didn't uh, even though we collect that data, we didn't use it. Um, if you're referring to the um, Radiative forcing factor, uh, we used 2.7, which is the one that Stanford was using. Um, so we multiplied by 2.7. Um, how were the refrigerated emissions ca calculated? Gathered data about refrigerant purchases, and those purchases are generally to replace refrigerant that's leaked, and then um, used the, uh, our, our, our consultant has the emission factors. So I see the note says seems very low. Um, yeah, pushed hard to be sure we were getting all the refrigerant data. Um, so I, I don't have a reason to think that was inaccurate. Okay. A uh, question from Laura, are single use plastics being considered separately in the greenhouse gas emissions inventory? 
they're not. So they would just fall within the goods and services purchased. Yeah, there's not a great way to, because so many products are, portions of them are plastic, or it, mm -hmm. it would be very difficult to calculate that. Uh, a question from Will. Is there a way to encourage alumni to use lower emission mm -hmm. travel to away games? That's a nice idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. We are going to note that and yeah. put that into our the work we, we're currently doing with air travel. We haven't yet taken responsibility for alumni travel, but <laughs> that does, does seem like an area of influence. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, what would be the frequency of updating the GHG inventory in the future? Great question. So we are, um, our office is committing to doing a emissions report every two years. Um, that said, we're, we are also working on updating the dashboard on our website now that we have this, uh, this current data. And we uh, are also in the process facilities as a whole of um, working to have better uh, system-wide data management related to energy and emissions. Um, and so we anticipate being able to have the tools we need to keep the our data on our website also much more current. So we are, uh, and one other note, we are, while we're going to do an inventory formal report every two years, we're not going to include goods and services uh, every two years. That's too big of a, a lift for the capacity of our office right now. Um, however, it may be something that with this new um, data management software tool that we are, that could be integrated and we, we might be able to do with a lot less expense and effort. <clears throat> so that's sort of to be determined. Okay, a question from Louise. UW Medicine or Comment is ranked number one in the country when it comes to health systems utilizing reusable devices and products. That's awesome. Yay. We have more work to do and are actively looking into additional opportunities. That's great. Thanks, Louise. Um, okay, the next question is from Peter. UW Facilities does a good job with refrigerant leakage management in my own experience. Yeah, okay. thank you for that. <laughs> and, and a comment related to that. Um, so many of you may realize we have a district energy system, meaning we have a central plant uh, and then distribute cooling and heating to individual buildings. And that's um, centralizing and particularly our cooling. And, and we're hoping to do a lot more of that because there still are chillers on individual buildings. But that is a big way to reduce refrigerant leakage because then we can have really good, high quality refrigerant management. It's harder to do if there are individual chillers or individual heat pumps out in, in just, you know, buildings all over campus. Yeah, I'll also add that, um, and thanks, Peter, for your comment. So Campus Energy Utilities and Operations, that's one of the units within facilities, does have a refrigerant management working group. Um, and we're also seeing some progress at the state level with phasing out some of the older refrigerants with really high global warming potential. So there's some progress being made statewide as well. Um, okay, next question from Chapman. Are there other universities who have had success on reducing emissions, including scope three, that we can borrow methods from? Or is UW closer to the front of the pack on these efforts? Um, Marilyn, why don't, you, why don't you go first and then I can... Maybe yeah, well, certainly um, one, you know, we're always looking at what other universities are doing so we can uh, borrow their strategies. Um, and the one I've looked at most closely at is air travel. And there are there are a, num a number of other u of universities that have established a fee um, and then used the money from that fee almost always to do a mission reduction work on campus. Um, those are fairly new and I I haven't seen data saying whether they've actually reduced travel because of that. But uh, in Europe, in Europe, we, I've seen more successful programs, um, including, you know, fee structures that have reduced travel um, efforts, like real creative efforts to um, move conference activities onto trains, for example. And of course, in Europe, there's a robust train system and shorter distances, so they have some options available that we don't. But there, there are some, some inspiring strategies people have used. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I think there was a similar inspiring story at a university in um, Singapore. Yeah, yeah, great question. I think um, Marilyn gave some great examples. I'd say um, as far as scope three and particularly with um, goods and services uh, in scope three, I'd say we're, we're 
sort of at the leading edge of that. University of Washington is. There's some. I, I know that Stanford has inventoried their their goods and services, and some other schools have as well. But I'd say it's less common. Um, I also think that um, in terms of our new green building standard rule, where we will have a requirement around embodied carbon for materials produced like steel and concrete, um, largely structural uh, products in buildings and construction. I also think we're sort of at the, the leading edge of that. Some, some other universities uh, have, that, have had that in place for a while, but not a ton. And I'd say it's really gaining a lot of momentum and traction right now. Um, recognizing that those are emissions that are out there today because of the, the product is produced uh, as opposed to operational emissions that occur over the life cycle of a piece of equipment. Okay, uh, a question from Forrest. Are there any gaps in data to fill in that we know of? You know, we uh, there's certainly, you know, we want to refine our, our um, purchasing data. Um, like I said, we really pushed hard to be sure we got all the tr all the purchase data. Um, our consultant said it still still seemed a little low, so it makes me worried that we've missed something, but we're going to keep looking for that. Um, didn't get um, ocean vessel fuel data. <laughs> I'm assuming that's a very small amount. It was included in 2005, and I just didn't... Uh, Managed to get it currently, but those are those are the only ones I'm aware of. But I, we're going to have to keep keep looking to be sure we're not missing anything. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I see one more question that I don't think we've looked at, and under the Q and A, which is, have you looked at emissions of, mm -hmm. from telecommuting? My previous company had to include the impact of working at home in their carbon footprinting. Uh, because the homes will use energy for additional heating and power that would not have otherwise been used if the home were not used as an office. So, so no, we haven't looked into that. That's a, it's an intriguing one. It, you know, this, the literal commute, of course, is, is zero, but there are, of course, as this comment suggests or question, there are emissions associated with working from home and particularly if you know if all our buildings are continue to fully heat and cool even if they're empty well great questions i think we got to the end of the list uh we had one more slide marilyn if you want to advance i think we did at least on just mm -hmm. highlighting a few ways to stay engaged with the UW Sustainability Office. Um, so I mentioned a few things that, that we do have newsletters, blogs, and current events so that you can join webinars like this and, uh, and other great events across the university that other units and departments and colleges are hosting. Um, a link to the Tacoma and Bothell Sustainability Offices. Uh, and then uh, a few of the ways that you can get involved are, are listed down there at the bottom. But again, go and, please go and visit our website. So with that, uh, I want to thank you everyone so much for, for joining this webinar. Um, we look forward to, to seeing you again for some future events and uh, please stay in touch. Thanks everybody.